One of the least often thought of parts of a shark's anatomy is the fin, specifically the dorsal fin. That sounds contradictory considering it's the dorsal fin that breaks the surface of the water when movies want to villainize the sea puppies. But it's usually the mouth, the colors, and the behavior that is focused on in shark discussions. At least, I assume so, if you're in those social circles. Anyway, despite all that, there was once an entire group of cartilaginous shark relatives that developed the most elaborate and interesting fins and spines to ever breach the surface of the water. And one of the most unusual examples of this group is the adorably diminutive Falcatus. Sexual dimorphism is when males and females of the same species have different physical traits. Most animals and some plants have this condition. There may be differences in secondary sex traits, size, weight, color, marks, behavior, or cognitive traits. Male-to-male -male competition for reproduction has led to a wide range of sexually dimorphic traits. In fights between foes, aggressive utility traits like battle teeth and blunt heads that can be used as battering rams are used as weapons. Sexual selection has also led to the development of passive displays such as feathers that are only used for decoration or calls that sound like songs. These changes could be small or big and they could be the results of sexual selection or natural selection. The reverse of dimorphism is monomorphism, which is when both biological sexes look the same on the outside. For example, humans are far more sexually monomorphic than they are dimorphic, as these sexes are quite similar when compared to even our closest relatives. These sexually dimorphic traits are often easy to visually spot in living animals, but when it comes to the long dead, it becomes a nightmarish puzzle. How do you tell the sexes apart when all you have is one specimen, or worse, half of a half of a single specimen? You simply don't. But what about when the fossil record just so happens to preserve a ton of specimens of a given species and was nice enough to cough them back out for us? Even then, there is some mystery. For dinosaurs, for example, the only definitive way to tell a male from a female is if you cut open the long bones and find deposits of medullary bone. This type of bone is stored inside long bones of females when they are pregnant as their body is getting ready to make their eggshells, which are composed of calcium. This makes the task more difficult because you might have a female dinosaur on your hands, but there is no medullary bone because she was not pregnant before she died. Sometimes, some dinosaurs are preserved in a mass death assemblage that captures a bunch of different age groups. This is more helpful because you can see what the babies or juveniles look like and how that changed as they aged and reached sexual and skeletal maturity. That is when sexual dimorphism becomes apparent. That may mean the growing of sexually dimorphic display traits, like frills and horns and crests. Even here, how do you know which one is male and which one is female? You don't really, besides inferences you can make based on how it works in living animals, be they unrelated but convergent mammals, closely related but ecologically alien birds and crocs, or the completely separate lizards and snakes. But what about the fossil records of animals that are much easier to understand, like fish and insects? We have direct relatives for many of these animals alive with us today and sometimes even without the caveats of the dinosaurs living cousins and descendants. Sexual dimorphism has been observed far more frequently in mammal, reptile, and fish fossil fauna than in dinosaurs. One of the most unusual and blatant examples of this fossil sexual dimorphism is in the adorable, big-eyed, little-finned cartilaginous fish that has come to be known as Falcatus falcatus. The first material known from the genus were the prominent fin spines that curve anteriorly over the head of the animal. This material had been known to science since at least 1837, as far as I can find anyway. The story that led to the current scientific identification is a long and very confusing one for me, as it seems the very first publications about this animal were of just some funky spines that Swiss-born American biologist, geologist, and fish freak Louis Agassiz wrote about in 1837. 
This work was written in German and not translated, so I cannot look into it myself. I mean, I wasn't even able to find the precise volume I was looking for, so I have to go off of the work done by Richard Lund all the way in 1985. However, the way he writes it is super confusing, so I hope I get it right. Richard Lund is the guy who first names, describes, and solves the mystery of Falcatus in 1985. He found that a bunch of cartilaginous fish fossils from the Bear Gulch limestone of Montana show an incredible level of sexual dimorphism, and that the fossils of the males match isolated fossils that had been known and named since the mid-1800s from various locales. Lund cites the oddly facial-haired Frederick McCoy, an Irish paleontologist, zoologist, and museum administrator, as the one who first named the isolated fossils that Lund is describing the full skeleton of all the way back in 1848. Those fossils were given the name Physonomus arcuatus. This was not the first species named and described for this genus, as the genus apparently goes back to the aforementioned Louis Agassiz in that 1837 publication that I cannot find or read. Paleontologists before the 1900s were usually super straight to the point in their scientific articles. No flourishes, no rambling, and rather little explanation as to the context of the fossils they describe. Sometimes this is refreshing as it is literally less to read, but it is most often frustrating for me as I cannot fully imagine the context under which the fossils were found, how they were found, and what happened to them prior to how we know them now. I'll add that a lot of paleontologists in the early 1900s did the opposite in their writings, often using personal pronouns and writing whole stories about their struggles to get their fossils. I like that sort of stuff. Forward to 1985, and Richard Lund says that the genus Physonomus was originally erected for Physonomus arcuatus by McCoy in 1848 to receive elegant, forwardly curved, well-ornamented Paleozoic fin spines of unknown affinities. In subsequent years, all other forwardly curved fin spines were assigned to the genus Physonomus, because of course they were. In 1889, American physician, geologist, and paleontologist John Strong Newberry put the species Physonomus altonensis into the genus Stethacanthus, as it had the form of an erect triangle, an anterior basal shoulder, a long, thin, hollow base, and was devoid of ornamentation. Over the next few decades, paleontologists were naming a bunch of new Stethacanthus species based on forward curved fin spines that may have been put into the Physonomus genus years before, with only a few species remaining in that old Physonomus genus, like Physonomus hamatus falcatus and attenuatus. I think Lund was trying to point out the somewhat dubiousness of the Physonomus genus as he lists off how and what other animals the spines that were referred to the various species ended up being associated with, and I guess those were different than whatever Physonomus was or was originally described as. Physonomus falcatus, amatus, and a series of morphologically close nominal species of spines from the Carboniferous of the Midwestern US are also associated with elasmobranch fish also close to Stethacanthus, and these are the ones that Lund reanalyzes and describes new fossils of in 1985. What I can make out from the text is that Lund found that the fin spines given the name Physonomus falcatus are indistinguishable from those found in the Bear Gulch limestone of Montana, but that the other fin spines given their own species name that are very similar to the Falcatus spines but distinct from anything within the Physonomus genus should be synonymized within the Falcatus species, but only provisionally until someone can find them to be truly distinct, those being Physonomus proclivus and Hamatus. So, the main chunk of the 1985 text is Lund's description of a bunch of new remains of what was previously called Physonomus falcatus, but that is actually too distinct and therefore requires a new genus name. Lund chose falcatus, making the animal falcatus falcatus, which is Greek for sickle, so sickle sickle. The original specimens were known from the St. Louis limestone of St. Louis, Missouri, and the Greenbrier limestone of Alderson, West Virginia, and of course the new specimens all come from the Bear Gulch limestone beds of the Bear Gulch member, Heath Formation, Big Snowy Group, south of Beckett, Fergus County, Montana. So now we can finally get to the actual critter. 
This is Falcatus, a small holocephalon of 25 to 30 centimeters or 10 to 12 inches, making it about as big as some of the smallest sharks around today. Enough complete skeletons with soft tissues were preserved in the Bear Gulch that the entire anatomy is known, and growth stages are as well. Juveniles and females were pretty average looking, with no spines and no first dorsal fin. The males, once they hit sexual maturity, would sprout a large patch of backwards pointing dermal dental spines on the top of their head, as well as a huge fin spine complex. This thing is composed of the same tissues that made up the first dorsal fin and the fin spine, seen in more normal looking cartilaginous fish. The tip and underside of this forward arching spine is covered in rows and patches of the same kind of spines as the top of the head. The females were short snouted while the males have a long goblin nose. The large soft snout strongly suggests that they had an ampullary sensory system for electric detection of prey like that of modern sharks. Both sexes have absolutely enormous peepers. These things took up the majority of their head space, suggesting a strongly visual predator. The pectoral fin has a trailing whip for maneuverability. The nearly symmetrical high aspect ratio tail suggests a cruisier rather than a sedentary shark. Falcatus was countershaded, darker above and lighter below, possibly similar to the sediment color, with head and spine probably colorful in males, for advertisement. Both sexes have exceedingly small teeth, at 0.3 millimeters max. Their teeth lined their jaws, and they also had some in their throat. The throat teeth may have been used by the female to grasp the male's antenna in a prelude to mating, as shown by direct fossil evidence. Phylogeny When Falcatus was first named, it was considered a stethacanthid. The stethacanthid chondrichthians share a number of special traits in common. The first dorsal fin spine complex is unique among the chondrichthys and contrasts strongly with the primitive condition of a small, superficial, ornamented spine. The first dorsal spine and fin of Cladocelachi represents the most probable proximate primitive condition from which that of the stethacanthids can be derived. All have a uniform cladodont dentition, which is the term for a common category of early Devonian shark known primarily for its multicusped tooth, consisting of one long blade surrounded by many short, fork-like tines designed to catch food that was swallowed whole, instead of being used to saw off chunks of meat like many modern sharks. The skinny teeth would puncture and grasp the prey, keeping it from wriggling free. Because the most common fossil evidence of cartilaginous fish is teeth, this term is also used for the fossilized teeth themselves. As it happens, researchers have done some housekeeping with the Stethacanthidae over the last four decades or so. Many more close relatives to Falcatus have been found, such as Denea, Ozarchus, Stethacanthulus, and Cretacladoides. These critters are enough to form their own group, the Falcatidae. Those fish that were thought to be stethacanthids have been moved around. The stethacanthid group itself was once thought to belong to the Cladodontida, a grand order of cartilaginous fish defined by the cladodont condition of their dentition. A separate group had also been known for a while, the Simoriaformes, or what had been called the Simoriida. Richard Lund lumped this group in with the Cladodontida. John Maisie corrected the name from Simoriida to Simoriaformes and then Cladodontida was merged with Simoriaformes so that it contains all of the weird finned cartilaginous fish, the Falcatidae, Sethacanthidae, and Simoriidae. There are some unplaceable weirdos in this group and possibly also the Cladocelachidae, but this is not solidly confirmed. All of these critters belong to the Holocephali order, meaning they are most closely related to today's chimeras and ratfish. Ecology. Falcatus comes from the Bear Gulch limestone this, Falcatus comes from the Bear Gulch limestone that, but what does it all mean? The Bear Gulch limestone is a continuously consistent layer of rock that all dates to a specific time with specific fossils in it that covers a large area and is sandwiched above and below between other layers of rock from before and after it. 
The Bear Gulch limestone is more specifically slapped with the label of lens because the layer is shaped like a lens, fat in the middle and skinny near the edges. And since the general processes of the rock cycle are a thing, no one formation is ever never ending. So the Bear Gulch is free to pinch off the extra bits to be a fun bean shape. The Bear Gulch limestone is found in Montana and has been dated to 324 million years ago. At this chunk of time, the Chesterian stage of the Mississippian subperiod of the Carboniferous period, the region was covered in mudflats, floodplains, and lagoons, filled with both brackish and fresh water. So why is this formation seen as a logostetan? That boils down to a few hypotheses, with a general agreement that the critters that died in the water in the area were able to survive the processes of decay long enough to be quickly buried and preserved nearly perfectly. So this could mean that there was an anoxic or oxygenless layer of the various lagoons. Anything that stayed there too long would die and fall to the bottom, or anything that died above the layer would subsequently sink below the layer. The layer would keep the vast majority of scavengers and bacteria away from the bodies, halting the decay process long enough for fine features to be preserved. Another possible explanation, in part or in whole, is that huge, periodic mudslides would swing on into the lagoons after heavy rainfall and violent storms to cover and kill anything that wasn't fast enough to get out of the way. Some evidence against this being the main vector of perfect fossilization is that many fish are found with their gills distended from their bodies, which is what is usually seen in asphyxiation. The world in which Falcatus lived was chock full of all sorts of strange fish. Falcatus lived alongside many strange creatures, like the Chondrichthians, Agassizidus, Lystracanthus, and Delphiodontos. It also lived alongside many ray-finned fish, like Discocera and Paratarasius. Other fish included the Rhabdodermatid Cardiosuctor, the Rhizodont Strepsidus, and Hardistiella one of the oldest known lampreys. The invertebrates of Bear Gulch were truly diverse creatures, like the Hoplocarids, which include modern-day mantis shrimp, Andorella, which is the youngest known Sinziphosurine, and more enigmatic creatures like Typhlosis, and these square objects which might be sea salps or Nidarians. Other invertebrates include mollusks like the nautiloid Tylonautilus, Terioid bivalves, which have been found encrusting sargassum like brown algae, as well as producted brachiopods, paleolimulus, phylocarids, and echinoderms like crinoids, echinoids, sea stars, brittle stars, and a many armed starfish called Lepidasterella montanensis. What more peculiar cartilaginous fish will be found next? Hopefully, something to help further organize them. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.